Praise the Lord. It's good to be with all of us here this morning. So we're just going to take a minute first of all, and we're just going to pray for, uh, we've got some people out ministering other places, and and we have uh, a lot of sickness in our church today. And so let's just stop and first thing, let's just lift those people up. Father, we just thank you that you're you told us that if two or three are gathered together in your name, you are here with us. And Father, we thank you for that. Thank you for that promise. And we just lift up our loved ones, our sick ones, those who are struggling in their bodies today, Lord. Just pray that your presence would just envelop those people, those places, that you would be near and comfort your grace, give them strength in your healing touch, Lord Jesus. Father, for those who are touching people in other places today, I pray, God, that you would just, your anointing would rest upon them and you would go before them and speak through them in Jesus' name. Father, also for our brothers and sisters in churches around us, Lord, we just start naming them off and it just gets so many. It, you know, First Church of God and Southeast Polk Family Church and at Evangel and Galilee and Eastside Naz and and uh, Grace Fellowship, Lord, and over at Simpson and at Sunshine. We just pray, God, that you would just uh, work in those churches as those people come together and as they worship you, that your presence would just fill those places. Lord, that we would see the power of God work in our city. We'd see revival come and hearts come to repentance. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last week we had Mike and Dara Rasavan with us. And I don't know about you, but uh, missionaries have always been my heroes. And from the time I was a little kid, the first missionary I ever saw, um, They've just been my heroes, and it was neat. We were able to give them a sizable offering, and I just praise God for all that. Um, we'll do, if you remind me, we'll do some more announcements at the end of service. Uh, but let's just uh, get going here and uh, just ask the Lord to be with us as, we're, as we worship in song. You know, a lot of times we don't think about, you know, John tells us that Jesus as God was with the Father in the beginning. John tells us that nothing was created that was created without Jesus. And this song, Everlasting God, is just talking about, Scripture says that, that as we wait upon the Lord, as we spend time with Him, He strengthens us. And that's what we're doing this morning. So let's worship Him. <laughs>
stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. You tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're good, good father. It's who you are. Father, we praise you for your love for us. Romans tells us, Lord, that that you demonstrate that love for us. Now, while we were still sinners, before we ever knew you, before we ever wanted you, Christ died for us. How great is your love for us, Lord. pray, Father, that today would you open our eyes to things that we've never seen. Lord, to our ears to things that we've never heard. Lord, that as you draw us 
into love, deeper love than we've known before. Let your name be praised, Lord. Thank you. I love after worship because after worship there's always more people here than were here before. It's awesome. All right. So we've been in the book of Luke, I'm sorry, we've been in the book of Acts for a long time. Luke wrote the book of Acts, and so that's why I stumble sometimes. And so this is actually number 18 in our series in the book of Acts. And we've just been going through this letter that Luke wrote to uh, what we believe to be either his former slave master or his current slave master. Luke was a physician, and for some reason, we don't know how it all happened, but Luke ended up um, much of the time as a travel companion for the Apostle Paul. And so in that time, Luke had an opportunity to really see for years this happening of the Holy Spirit working in the life of people who wanted to follow Jesus. And so, uh, we don't know what stimulated this letter, but the book of Luke was the first letter that Luke wrote to Theophilus, who was his, uh, probably his former master or current master. Maybe Theophilus came to Jesus and sent Luke to um, be with the Apostle Paul because at that time in the Roman Empire most physicians were slaves. And so Luke was the first book, the first letter that he wrote to Theophilus and then the book of Acts is the second letter that he wrote really just to bring Theophilus up to speed and us with what had happened in the early church. Understand that, that the book of Luke really takes the life of Jesus from his birth. And by the time Luke writes the book of Acts, it's probably 30, 40, 50 years later, and so much has happened. Most of the apostles are old men by now, where when they first started following Jesus, they were young men. And so last week we talked about an unlikely candidate, Oop, sorry about that, go ahead, I'll let you do it, thanks. We talked about an unlikely candidate, and what really happened was Peter, who was a Jew, was called by the Holy Spirit to go and speak to this Roman centurion, who was a, a, a Roman army officer, and and to us, that doesn't seem like as big a deal. It wasn't just that he was a Roman army officer. It was that he was a Gentile, and Jews were forbidden to fellowship with Gentiles. They were forbidden to go into a Gentile's home. They were forbidden to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So this is the story we learned last week of, of Peter, the Holy Spirit working in Peter and showing him that God doesn't have favoritism. God doesn't care what color you are. God doesn't care what nationality you are. God doesn't care what side of the tracks you came from. It doesn't matter. He's no respecter of persons. He doesn't show favoritism. And as he showed this to Peter, Peter then was willing to go out of town to Caesarea and find the centurion. And so we saw that in, in that, that God, to God, there are no unlikely candidates. Many times we look at people walking down the street and we go, ah, I don't know that they would be a great follower of Jesus or not. 
So some of the things that we learned last week, some of the scriptures we used was one of this one, that Paul said this. He said, for you are all, or I'm sorry, this is uh, Peter speaking this. I'm sorry, I, I take that back. This is Paul speaking this. And this is later on. He was actually the, the recipient of the gospel. And he says, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. He says, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Let me just take a, a stop right here. You know, there's one thing that you don't see in the scriptures in the New Testament, even though they dealt with all of the social issues that we deal with today. Jesus knew that it had to be heart change to make changes. And so even with slave and free, in the gospel, we address those slave and free as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And you'll see that in the New Testament. It's fascinating to see how the church handled slavery. And so he goes on to say, and now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. And we're all Gentiles in this, with uh, maybe one exception in this room, that we all are Gentiles, and so we have become heirs to the promise of Abraham. And then Paul goes on to this in 2 Corinthians. He says, therefore, come out from among unbelievers. And separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. I think, wow, well, well, God, how do we reach the lost if we're not supposed to have anything to do with them? And he goes on, he says, When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You'd have to leave this world to avoid people like that. He says, I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worships idols or is abusive or is a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. So this week we're going to look at uh, week number 18 in our series in the book of Acts. And I've called it, Watch Out for Scammers. So there is a story behind the title. So I'll just tell you that, you know, from the time I can ever remember the first time I ever played the piano, I always wanted to have a grand piano in my house. I've never had one. But I've always wanted one, and, and I've just so enjoyed the different sound that a grand piano makes rather than a piano like this. or you know, It's just so different. And so I got an email a few days back from another pastor, and he, he said that he had a line on a grand piano for free from an estate. And he said, if anybody's interested, just text the person through this number. So I did. So I started communicating with this person about this grand piano, and they sent me pictures, and, and we talked about, you know, how to get it from there to here and how much it was going to cost. And because even though the piano was free, there was going to be a cost in obviously shipping it to wherever it had to go and setting up wherever it was. And as I got down further down the road, all of a sudden my spidey senses started going off. There's something not right here. There's something not right here. Something about it being too easy, not costing enough. All of a sudden these things that where I taught other people about how to identify scams, all of a sudden in my mind I'm going, there's something wrong. And sure enough, this minister, his corporate email had been hacked. 
And this was all a scam. I hadn't sent out any money. I didn't lose anything. I was just really disappointed. But we see in Scripture, we see in Scripture a continued uh, careful watch to make sure that we don't get scammed about the gospel because everywhere we go, everybody has a little different twist on the gospel. And the apostles were very careful to make sure that the gospel that they preached at the beginning never, ever changed. The gospel was the gospel, was the gospel, is the gospel, will always be the gospel. So what's a scam? Somebody tell me, what's a scam? What? What? False intent. Somebody else? I heard more than one, so say it again. Come on, say it again. Being taken advantage of. Okay, it seems like most of the time scams are usually have some kind of a financial twist. That's usually what people are trying to do is to get money. And I looked up in Webster's, and scam is a fraudulent or deceptive act or operation. Okay. It's deception, it's deceiving, it's a lie. Somewhere in there, there's a lie. There's, there's taking something true and twisting it into something that isn't true or isn't, no, isn't any longer true. Taking something that used to be true, that may have been true, taking something and, and there's just enough twist, just enough lie to make it wrong. When I was conversing with this person who supposedly had the free piano, all of a sudden I start hearing things that, that because I've been the, around the block once or twice, all of a sudden, that doesn't make sense. That can't be. And then they're trying to convince me, trying to persuade me. I begin to realize they're trying to persuade me too hard. This is too great a deal to have to try to persuade anybody. So scams are usually uh, come about to try to trick you out of your money. But there's a deception that is more sinister than just losing money. And that deception can cost people their eternal souls. And that deception is when the gospel, when the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is twisted into something that it was never intended to be. And as early as the Garden of Eden, you see God's Word being twisted. Satan twisted it in the Garden of Eden to deceive Eve into thinking that what God had said really wasn't true. So look at this. There is always deliberate deception behind false teaching, even if the speaker is ignorant. There are times that there are people who have who feel they understand God incorrectly or the gospel is wrong, and maybe that's how they've been taught, and it's not always even intentional they're misleading. But behind it is always a deliberate deception. You know, in every book of the Bible, I was thinking through every book of the Bible, with the exception of perhaps Ruth and Song of Solomon, there is always this deception. There is something that twists God's word into something to mislead his people. Look at this verse out of Isaiah or out of Revelation. This dra great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Satan is the one behind all the deception, deceiving the world, trying to mislead us. So we learned some things about Scripture. We're going to go through a little bit in the book of Acts here in just a minute, but I want to just make a couple statements here that imposters, deceivers, and scammers will come. God promises that to us. And I'll show you some Scripture here to 
to support that. But Jesus even says that it's going to happen. This is what Paul says to Timothy. He says, but evil people and imposters will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. Paul is writing to Timothy, who is a minister. He's over a large group of Christians, and he's saying these imposters and evil people will flourish. Flourish means that they're going to just have a heyday. They'll be blessed. It will seem they just do whatever they want. In Matthew, Jesus said this. Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. Jesus says there are going to be all kinds of people coming in my name, saying that I'm he, and many people will be tricked into believing their message. Many. All around us. I don't, every week, a week doesn't pass that I don't listen and Talk to someone who has been tricked. Who has been deceived. Peter says this. He says, but there were also false prophets in Israel. Way back. Hundreds of years before Peter is writing this, he's saying there were false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you today. False teachers among us in the church. In the church, there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. In this way. So here's what we see. In the New Testament, there's a continual pattern in the New Testament of leaders verifying reports of what God is doing by the fruit. Let me say that one more time. So in the New Testament, whenever we hear great things about people coming to Jesus and there's a new work starting here and a new work starting there, This is the pattern. You see the leaders of the church going to that place and making sure that it's real. Making sure that these people are following the same gospel that they preached. It's a repeated pattern of finding purity in the message of the gospel. That's why we spend so much time in the word making sure that what we preach is what the Bible says. Because there's so much out there of people twisting the Bible. There's a repeated warning, message of warning to believers of those that would corrupt the truth. I just had a note here to myself. Our early church leaders always compared what they saw with what God had done with them in the beginning. Let me show you a couple places. And so what we see is these guys always compare the fruit. Jesus said, by their fruits, you will know them. He says, watch out for these false teachers because by their fruit, you'll be able to tell. You'll be able to look at them, you'll be able to hear what they say and watch their lives and you'll be able to tell whether or not they're really of me. So let's watch here. We're going to look in Acts chapter 11. I'll just read a few verses here. Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 15. Peter is defending himself. Because remember, last week, Peter went to Cornelius, who is a Gentile. And so now the Jews, the Jewish Christians back in Jerusalem... There, Peter, what are you doing? You can't go to the Gentiles. Peter, what's going on? And so Peter begins to explain himself. And he explains to them what happened and and how he ended up, the Holy Spirit told him to go to the Gentiles. And then, as he's preaching to Cornelius, Peter says this, And as I began to speak, Peter continued, 
The Holy Spirit fell on them just as He fell on us at the beginning. You see, Peter compared what was happening to Cornelius with what happened to them. He says, I saw in Cornelius' house, the Gentile house, the very same thing happened to them that happened to us in the beginning. He's comparing the fruit. He says, then I thought of the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since, and listen to his logic. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? And so Peter compared what was happening to Cornelius with what, with what had happened to him. And he said, it's the same thing. It's the same gospel. It's the same experience. When the others heard this, listen, when the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. You see, they heard the comparison. They realized that it was God doing the same thing in the Gentiles that he had done in them. And when the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. You see, at first, they were concerned that what was happening to Cornelius in his house was a scam. But they saw that it was real because they compared it to what had happened to them. So we'll go on in Acts. It says, Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. And if you don't know what happened at Stephen's death, you can go back and look at the previous videos or just read back in Acts chapter 6 and 7. However, some of the believers who had went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. But when the church in Jerusalem heard what had happened, you see, here they are back again. This is where it all started. And when, it, when those people heard what had happened in Antioch, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw the evidence of God's blessing. He was filled with joy, and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. And so here again, you see Barnabas going from Jerusalem to Antioch to check out what was happening. And he saw in Antioch the same thing that had happened to them in Jerusalem. And his heart was filled with joy because he realized here that it wasn't a scam. God was doing the same thing to them so let's look at a couple of the verses that we just read here. Peter said in 11.15, As I began to speak, Peter continued, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as He fell on us at the beginning. So when someone has some different view of Christianity, we need to compare it with what the Word says. We need to compare it with what we know. That's what Peter did. He compared what happened to Cornelius with what happened to him. And in it's verse 17, And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift He gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? So now Peter is convinced that it's real. Again, what we just read, when he, Barnabas, arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he saw the fruit. He saw in these Gentiles in Antioch, he saw God working in them the same as God had worked in them. There was life change in Antioch, just like there was life change in Jerusalem. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, But the gateway to life is very narrow. And the road is difficult. And only a few ever find it. Think about that. Think what Jesus is saying. That the road to eternal life is narrow and it's hard. And not very many people 
find it. He says, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. That tells you that these false prophets look like us. They may look and smell like us, but the message, there's something wrong with it. And he says, you can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way they act. He says, can you pick grapes from thorn bushes? Or figs from thistles? He says the fruit will always tell the truth. The fruit will always tell the truth. So here's what happens. So scammers offer you something that sounds kind of right. If it didn't sound right, if the email that I got about the piano didn't sound right, I never would have called. If it didn't come from a reputable place, I never would have called. It sounded right. It sounded good. But as I got down into the weeds, something wasn't right. We have to recognize when something isn't right with the fruit. The deeper I got down into this process of getting this piano, I realized something stinks. They weren't rude to me. There was nothing that they said that was evil. But I realized that there was something devious. There's something about fruit. There's something about fruit. I'm going to drive this home just a little bit more. So my dad was raised on a peach ranch out in Colorado. Until the day he died, it was always kind of a joke when we'd bring him peaches. Because the peaches that we buy in the store today were the ones that they threw away. They were the last peaches. They were the ones that they'd, you know, give away. Dad used to tell me about the peaches that they had that were the size of large navel oranges or grapefruit, really. And every time we took dad peaches in his mind, he's comparing the fruit. And it may taste decent, it may be all right, but in his mind he's going, it ain't the same. is isn't the same. Same thing happened with my dad's lemons. He had lemons in his at his house in Phoenix, and and we buy. <laughs> Diana has a recipe for a baked chicken, and she uses lemons in the cavity of the chicken, and and the ch- the lemons that we get typically are about like this, right? And the lemons that were on my dad's tree were more like this. And I'm always looking at those lemons coming out of the chicken or lemons in the bottom of the fridge. And I'm going, what is this really? Because it's not the same. And the Lord wants us, he challenges us to make sure that the fruit is what we want it to be. So how do scams get started? How do they get started? When we're talking about the gospel, one of the things that happens is is that we disregard what the Bible says. We know that the Bible says that we have to trust in the Lord. We know that Jesus says, how can you say you love me and not do what I say? Jesus is comparing the fruit. He's saying, how can you do this? How can you say this and yet your life doesn't show this? You say you love me, but your life doesn't say you love me. Jesus is comparing the fruit. And so what happens is, is that we don't like what the Bible says, says, so we decide what makes sense to us instead of seeing what the Bible says. We use our logic 
and say, well, I don't really like what the Bible says, but I'm going to try to be a Christian or I'm going to be Christian-like, but I'm not going to do what the Bible says. And so we have to beware of those that say, I believe or I think or I don't believe God would do this or that. And so what happens is, is when we entertain these kind of thoughts in our lives, we begin to um, redefine Christianity. So we begin to create our own religion. And so the difference between us and other groups that have actually started their own religion is that we do it on an individual basis and others have done it on a large basis and gathered followers. And I'm not talking about I'm not talking about the churches that we pray for every every Sunday morning. I'm not talking about churches around us that preach the gospel. There are churches around us that have different uh, traditions in their church, but they still preach the gospel. They're still saved by faith in the blood of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus on Easter. Those are our brothers and sisters in Christ. But when we start to redefine our Christianity, it becomes contrary to what the Bible teaches. Over time, we move further and further and further from the truth. I hired, I hired a lady to do some work for us at the church. And she let me know at the very beginning um, where she was, that, that, uh, that she believed in God, but... Uh, don't try to persuade me because I got my own, I got this all settled out. I got this, I got my own thing that I'm doing here. And we do this, we do this in our lives. We listen to people, but God told me, and listen to, listen to this, God will not tell you that something's okay when he's already said that it isn't. He says, I am the Lord. I do not change. The God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. Nothing has changed in who God is and what He desires. Listen to this from Ezekiel. Ezekiel was an Old Testament prophet uh, probably, uh, let me see, 700 years before Jesus was born. And he says this, And your prophets cover up for them uh, these are leaders who are going their own way. He says, And your prophets cover up for them by announcing false visions and making lying predictions. They say, My message is from the Sovereign Lord when the Lord hasn't spoken a single word to them. So how do you keep from getting scammed? How do I keep from getting scammed? How do I keep from being deceived? The first thing we need to do is know the truth. My sister-in-law used to be a bank teller. And I remember when she first got her job as a bank teller. You know, they, bank tellers get all kinds of money. Old money, new money, fake money. Right? There are all kinds of counterfeit money out there. Well, they didn't try to teach her about all of these other counterfeit monies. What they taught her was how to know real money. And she became, came to the place where in her hands she could tell real money so that any time a counterfeit bill came into her hands, it just like, whoop, wrong. And that's what we have to know. We have to know what the Bible speaks. We have to know the truth. In fact, Paul says this in Colossians. He says, I'm telling you this so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. There will be people that come to us with great arguments. They sound convinced. They're convinced of what they, of what they say. 
even if it's true, untrue. And then the next thing we do is we guard the truth. This is what the scripture tells us to do. In fact, in 1 Timothy, Paul says this to Timothy. He says, Timothy, guard what God has entrusted to you. Avoid godless, foolish discussions with those who oppose you with their so-called knowledge. So don't even argue with them. There's no point. There's no point in arguing with them. He says to Timothy in another letter, he says, through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. Don't let that truth be twisted. And then we need to be aware. John says this to us in 1 John. He says, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. Wow. But they said that... He said, Don't believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. Many. So another one here that Paul says to the Corinthians. Uh, so he's really talking about uh, division in the church. He's really talking about getting along with each other. And he says, so that Satan will not outsmart us. Do this. He says, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. We understand it helps us to be aware of how the devil works. You know, when I was going through the scam process with this person, I knew how scammers work. And all of a sudden, I started seeing some of those indicators. Sometimes we don't know at first. Sometimes we see, we don't know at first, and all of a sudden we start seeing fruit. Oop, oop, oop. Something wrong with that, and we start finding that we're dealing with something false and the other thing that we can do to help us keep from being deceived is to spend time with people that know and practice the truth coming to church having Christian friends going to coffee with the pastor having Christians over in your home In the book of Hebrews, it says this, you must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened by God. It's an active process. You know, we used this verse a few weeks ago out of Galatians. The Apostle Paul was so serious about the gospel, keeping the gospel true. This is what he said. He said, let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say again, what we have said before, if anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcomed, let that person be cursed. Because, because the purity of the gospel affects people's lives. And a false gospel gives people false hope and leads them in a false way. We'll end with this. But this is what the Lord says in Isaiah chapter 48. He says, Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, who teaches you what is good for you and leads you along the paths you should follow. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you have given us truth. That your word speaks life. That your spirit works in us, O oh God, to change the way we live. Father, be praised.
If you haven't gotten taken a uh, communion set, go ahead and do that real quick. If you didn't do that. Now that's why we do what we do. Even communion we do because that was the example set for us. Paul says in Corinthians, he says, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, thanks guys, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he did this. On the night that he knew that his best friends, those that had been the closest to him, lived, ate, ate and slept with him for the last three years, he knew that that night every one of them would betray him. And he says, do this. When you come and you do this, do it to remember my body which is broken for you, my blood that is shed for you. Every time, remember, don't forget. Don't forget. So, Father, we come before you today. We thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for the blood you shed for us, for your body that was broken for us, the sacrifice, the Perfect Lamb, as John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that faith in you removes our sin. We thank you for your blood that washes us clean. Lord, we pray, O God, today that as we leave, that we would not be like your followers that first night. That, it, that denied you the very first day, ran away when you were in trouble. Lord, I pray we would remember. Thank you, Lord. Let's eat together. Now, sometimes when we talk about doing things a certain way, almost sounds like our mom and dad, when we were kids, you got to do it this way. And when we get older, we think, well, it doesn't have to be that way. We can do it a little bit different way. You know, Paul tells us that if Jesus, if it wasn't necessary... If we could go to heaven doing things our own way, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. If we could follow the old Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments, and get there on our own, Jesus never would have had to die. The reason Jesus died was because we can't. And a verse that our kids know well is John 3.16 that says God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes or trusts in him won't perish but will have everlasting life and he goes on to say this is actually Jesus talking to one of the religious leaders he says but God didn't s send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He didn't come to condemn because the world was already condemned. That's why he came. 
It isn't that if we don't follow Jesus, he's going to condemn us. We're already condemned. We're already condemned. As Romans says, Paul says, he says, God demonstrated his great love for us because he didn't want us condemned. He demonstrated his love that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh. Thank you, Father, for your great love for us. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, help us guard our hearts this week. Guide our ways. Help us to hear when things aren't quite right. Lord, protect us from being deceived. In Jesus' name, amen.